All right, well, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. We are going to be talking about peregrine falcons today. My name is Ava Michael. I'm an AmeriCorps wildlife educator with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And today joining me is Jess Wolf. Um, she is a conservation educator and she will be watching over the Q&A box for any questions you might have during the presentation. Um, I do encourage you to wait to put those questions in until the very end in case I answer any of your questions along the way. All right, um, just a quick reminder, thank you for everyone joining in um, for a conservation education program. This is a family program and it is rated PG. Um, so keep any questions you might be putting in the Q&A box on topic and appropriate. So um, yes, yeah, so failing to follow these guidelines will result in being muted in the chat or Q&A box or being removed from the live stream. All right. All right, so today we are gonna be talking about subspecies. Um, behavior of the peregrine falcons, their habitat and range, their size, they're very small birds, which is very interesting for how powerful they are, their lifespan, their nesting and parenting styles, their adaptations, and how they are a Guinness World Record holder. We're going to go over their diet and hunting strategies, falconry, their status currently and historically, and their threats that they are experiencing, the impact of DDT, the effects of mercury nowadays and their conservation and management, the banding and transmitters that are being used to monitor and evaluate and identify um, individuals within the population and how their population has changed over the years. All right, so first off, let's talk a little bit about them. So their scientific name is Falco peregrinus. Um, their classification is raptor or bird of prey. Um, they are very carnivorous. They don't really eat plants or seeds or anything like that. They do um, eat meat and they are very good hunters. They are technically the world's fastest animals. However, they are mostly known for their diving capabilities. There are 11 recognized subspecies and they are crow sized. So, so they are very small and they can be characterized by their blackish helmets and their mustaches. Um, people tend to think that they look like mustaches. I think it just looks like they have a dark cheek, um, but every um, different subspecies kind of has a different variation of coloring. All right, so the subspecies that we do see in North America are the American or Falco peregrinus anatum, um, which is the majority of the population in the United States. The other two we don't see quite as often, especially in Nevada. Um, so we are mostly talking about the American when we are talking about populations within Nevada. All right, so the second one is the Arctic or Falco peregrinus tundrius. And this is more migratory. Um, so this one a little bit, but it doesn't really stay for long. And then we have Pelis or Falco peregrinus pile, and this is mostly coastal. So it tends to stay very close to the coast and um, doesn't really stray far from there. All right, so let's talk about their behavior. So they are very active during the day, especially in the morning and evening time. This is when they like to hunt. And they are typically very solitary animals unless it is during nesting or breeding season. And then they tend to stay around their mate or around um, the hatchlings. And they do establish and defend their territories. They are very aggressive birds. So if you or any other animal are coming close to their nest or their, um, their hatchlings, they will make a noise, but they do often defend their nest uh, very aggressively with their talons. So be aware of that. But they, the size of the territory typically depends on the density of the food resources available. All right, so they do have a very broad range. You can find them on almost every continent. They are the most widely distributed birds of prey in the world, as you can see on this map, which is fairly recent. However, there have been some changes. Um, I spoke to one of 
the biologists and researchers, Joe Barnes, and he was telling me that around the Lake Mead and Great Basin area, they have found more nesting mates. Um, so this is new information. So this map is not showing everything um, because Nevada on this map, it tends to look more like it's a migratory route. It doesn't really show many breeding pairs, but there are breeding pairs currently. So from, they are, they can be found from the Arctic tundra through Canada, the United States and Mexico, and some will migrate set to South America. And they are found on every continent except for Antarctica, and they can't really be found in many of the oceanic islands. All right, so their habitat, they typically stay along the mountain ranges, river valleys, and coastlines. They are found everywhere from tundra to desert, but they do prefer wide open spaces like coastlines or grasslands. Um, historically, we've typically thought of peregrine falcons as being more along the coast and more and closer to water sources. However, we have found that their population can be more arid. They can stray from, from water sources 40 or more miles, which is very new information. All right, but they can often be, often be found in urban habitats, especially south near Las Vegas. You, you can find them very often along the buildings um, and they tend to look at buildings as cliff sides. Uh, because they like high elevation spaces, they do love these skyscrapers and tall buildings and they will nest along the building ledges and they can find plenty of food available. We've seen that they've actually started hunting bats um, so typically they are more active during the day, but whenever they are hunting bats, sometimes they will start hunting at night to catch the bats. And the bats tend to be more active because they are going closer to these neon lights, which are attracting insects. So they're hunting for insects and then the peregrine falcons are hunting for the bats. All right, so their size, again, they are crow size. So they're fairly small. The females like many raptors, tend to be bigger than the males. The females are around 19 inches tall, the males around 13 inches tall. And their wingspan can range from 3.3 to 3.6 feet. And their weight ranges from 18.8 to 56.5 ounces. All right, now their lifespan. In the wild, they do tend to live shorter lives. Um, this can be up to 17 years. The oldest one recorded was 19 years old and it was living in the wild. Um, but on average in the wild, they do live shorter lives because it is a very harsh life that they do lead. Um, being an apex predator and top of the food chain, um, they do have a lot of hardships during their life. So they don't tend to live that long. Um, I know Joe Barnes in the southern region, he was saying that the oldest one he has found was 10 years old. All right, now their courtship. They tend to have a pretty intricate courtship and it's very important. So they mate for life. Um, they tend to stay with the same partner their entire lifetime unless that partner um, dies or does not come back the following year. So the males will work very hard to attract the females with aerial displays. Sometimes you can see them diving or swooping down and doing all these incredible aerial acrobatics. Um, but they do also bring females food. This can be while they're nesting as well. They tend to bring the females who are incubating the eggs food. So that way they do not need to leave these nests. But while they're um, while they are trying to find a mate, they will often bring the female food. The females also later on, they will tend to grab the grab prey or food from the male's talons. So they kind of bully the male and take their food as well. And this can be during mid flight. You can find some incredible pictures of this, um, but they, they'll tend to kind of wrap around and grab that food from the male's talons but they only stay together during nesting season. The rest of the year, they are fairly solitary. All right, so whenever they are nesting, this is around, um, this is around March time that they start nesting, but they will lay eggs in hollow depressions in the soil or gravel. You'll kind of see that whenever they're creating these depressions in the soil, they'll kind of push 
um, any debris or soil out of the way and make that indent in the soil or gravel. And they will nest on cliffs, crevices, water towers, or skyscrapers. The higher up the elevation tends to be the better option for them. So they do lay around two to four eggs. The eggs are reddish color and they're kind of speckled as you can see in the picture. Um, sometimes they will lay uh, six, but those don't tend to live. So if you do see a nest and you see one egg that is pushed to, to the side of the main cluster of eggs, um, that is because that is a bad egg and the mother or the father is no longer taking care of it. So whenever they are finding places to nest, they tend to look at elevations of 25 to 1,300 feet in height, and they will often return to the same nesting spot each year. Um, there are some that are around 100 years old. This doesn't necessarily mean the same pair, but this means that it's just that same space is being used. Um, so it's still being debated on what causes a nesting pair to leave a certain area and move, but often um, biologists will see this happen, that a perfectly fine spot um, will no longer be used by that pair, and it might actually be taken by a new pair of peregrine falcons. All right, now their parenting style. Uh, around 60% of peregrine young will not make it to one year, so they need to be very vigilant parents and raise their young. Both will raise their, their young. The female will tend to stay or to incubate the eggs longer than the male while the male is bringing in food, but they both do care for their young and raise their young together. And they will incubate these eggs for about 28 days, and they will still take care of and um, keep the babies warm while they're growing. All right, so the young, they take about 36 hours, or it takes about 36 hours for a chick to peck out of its shell, and they are able to fly after about 40 days. They will remain dependent on their parents for approximately two months before they leave the nest after five to six weeks after hatching. All right, so younger birds do tend to be darker and have darker markings, maybe a dark brownish color depending on the subspecies. Uh, but you can see in this picture, the one to the right is fairly dark compared to the other one. And at two years of age, they do acquire adult plumage. And the summer of their second year, that is when they tend to find a mate and start their own nest. But it isn't until age three that they will reach sexual maturity. All right, so adaptations. Peregrine falcons have incredible adaptations. It's very important that they are good flyers. So they have this streamlined body that's kind of a teardrop shape. And it's one of nature's most aerodynamic designs just because it's incredibly fast and it doesn't have much drag. All right, but they do have those sharp talons too, which are great for catching prey mid-flight, which is also um, very important to them. And then their eyesight. They have great eyesight. They are able to find and lock down on their prey from 1.5 kilometers away. Um, so they have these very large, very sharp eyes. All right, now they are Guinness World Record holders. The, the peregrine falcon is the fastest bird when diving. And the, the bird that got this record was named Frightful from um, Friday Harbor in Washington, and it was clocked at 242 miles per hour. Now, this was in 2005, and they were actually able, um, they actually had scientists on and engineers who designed this chip that could be placed on the tail to monitor um, monitor the speed of this while she was diving for her prey or stooping. Diving whenever it's a peregrine falcon is called stooping. All right, but they are the fastest documented bird and they can hurdle thousands of feet through the air at around 200 miles per hour. So they use vertical flight to compensate for their horizontal speed. They're not the fastest flyers whenever they are flying horizontally. You can see 
even pigeons outflying them whenever they are flying horizontally. So it's important that they have this diving capability so that way they can capture these birds. All right, so here is a good illustration of how they kind of streamline, streamline themselves and they tuck in those wings so that way they are more compact and can dive and create almost this missile shape with their body. All right, now their diet. They are carnivores and their diet heavily depends on what is available, but they will mostly eat birds, um, especially those that congregate around, um, around aquatic areas. They tend to love waterfowl. Now the birds make up about 77 to 99% of their diet, but the younger peregrine falcons might eat insects and whenever it comes to small mammals, most of, this, um, most of this is just bats. Peregrine falcons will often hunt, bat, hunt bats. All right, so in Nevada, they do have a very specific diet though, the traditional, meaning those that are congregating around water sources, um, those will eat more, more of the eared grebe, the morning dove and the great, tail, great tailed grackle bats and the American coot. Now, those that are arid, meaning 40 plus miles away from a water source, are will eat morning doves, rock pigeons, wa white-throated swifts, great-tailed grackle, and house finches. All right, now when hunting, they are very skilled hunters. They prey on other birds and bats mid-flight, um, so they have to have that good coordination coordination and eyesight, and they hunt from above. So often what they will do is they will perch at high elevations in a tree, on a cliff, on top of a building, and then they will look out for their prey. And once they spot it, they will fly above their prey and then do a quick dive or stoop. And then they will capture their prey with their talons. And if their prey does not die from their talons, they may sever the cervical vertebrae with their beak. Um, so they have a very hard, strong, sharp beak. So they will sometimes hunt up to several kilometers from the nest site. All right, now falconry. Peregrine falcons have commonly been favored in falconry for centuries. So males are typically preferred because they are considered more aerodynamic and they are very small. So they are often ideal for bet for pest bird control, um, especially in agricultural areas where there tends to be a lot of birds, maybe starlings in the area. Um, they will bring in peregrine falcons and then they will not have to worry about those pests quite as much. And they are also used at airports. Now you do have to be trained to handle a falcon um, along these airports, but they have noticed an incredible decline in birds going into the engines or congregating along the runways at airports. All right, now they were considered endangered at one point from 1970 to 1995, they were endangered and they were endangered in Nevada as well. So they are no longer listed as endangered, thankfully, due to reintroduction into many areas. And the efforts that went into this and making sure that there were breeding programs and that these birds could be reintroduced into their habitats. Um, so captive breeding programs helped increase the populations in Canada and the United States. All right, so currently they are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which regulates the taking of peregrine falcon and all other migratory birds in the United States. All right, threats. Peregrine falcon is at the top of the food chain in almost every habitat that it does habitate, um, but they are fast and aggressive, which is why they don't have many predators. They don't often have to worry about predation, except for whenever they are very young and maybe the parent leaves them to go get food. That is often when they're most vulnerable, especially to golden eagles and great horned owls. Now adults do sometimes get preyed upon, but it's not quite as frequent or quite as often. Um, they are, there are uh, some diseases that the peregrine falcons do are susceptible to, but that is not often one of the top 
reasons for their mortality. All right, so there are a few threats to the adults except for people for humans. Um, sometimes peregrine falcons, they will run into a power line and we'll often see that that's how they died or sometimes they will get shot by people. Um, but typically one of the top reasons that they will get killed is because of people. All right, so let's talk about why they were endangered. So uh, the use of pesticides as well as DDT, especially DDT, uh, was the main reason why they were considered endangered. Um, and it harmed many bird species, not just the peregrine falcons, but since the peregrine falcons at, are at the top of their food chain, this means that they eat a lot of the animals that were also exposed to DDT and other pesticides. So their body became very weakened and absorbed it in their tissue. And this caused a lot of issues and it caused them to lay thin shelled eggs or to not even lay eggs at all. And this is because those eggs didn't have the right amount of calcium in them. They didn't harden quite as well. So whenever you can see in the picture that the peregrine falcon is laying on top of her young, um, but she also does this whenever she is incubating the eggs. And whenever she would do this, sometimes those eggs would break and crack and then she would lose that nest of eggs or that clutch of eggs. All right, so the impact of DDT had lasting effects and it had effects all throughout many ecosystems. So the population of peregrine falcons specifically dropped um, until it only, until there was only 12% of the previous population remaining in the United States. Um, so this caused them to become endangered and by the late 1960s, uh, they were nearly eradicated from the Eastern, Eastern North America and Boreal Canada. Now by 1969, Canada did ban DDT use and it wasn't until 1972 that the United States banned DDT use as well. Now DDT is still used in many other countries. However, in the United States, because we have done this, we've seen that the population could rebound and that it could come back to a healthy amount. All right, so pop, the population did rebound and this is in a large part because of captive breeding programs. Um, and this helped to increase populations in Canada and, and the United States. Now falconers had been using different methods of keeping falcons captive and of breeding them. And a lot of the methods that they used were utilized in these captive breeding programs. So because we had this prior knowledge of how to raise peregrine falcons and how to make sure they had a healthy, um, a healthy cluster or a clutch, um, we were able to do this successfully and reintroduce them into many habitats that they had previously been living in. All right, so although we aren't seeing as many impacts from DDT, one of the new things that we are seeing is mercury. Now mercury, this, is, this information is coming from the Southern region. Uh, Joe Barnes talked to me at length about how mercury is impacting these populations, but this is something new that many scientists and wildlife biologists are studying now because it is affecting many different predators and many different bird species. Now, mercury is bioaccumulating in aquatic systems and in these peregrine falcons. And this just means it's impacting many of the microorganisms and many of those organisms are getting eaten by larger organisms up until it reaches the peregrine falcon at the top of the food chain. So it's impacting multiple animals and organisms. However, the peregrine falcon, because it is eating, um, eating animals that have been eating other animals that were exposed to this, it's getting more, more of a harsh effect from it. So it potentially causes neurological issues in people as well. This is something we shouldn't just think about whenever we're thinking about wildlife populations. We should think about whenever we are using these water sources as well, because this can be harmful to us too. Now in birds, especially the peregrine falcon, it can impact their nervous system, their circulatory system, and their endocrine system. Now the endocrine system can have a real dramatic impact on the fertility, 
Um, this is still being studied. We're still finding new information, but this can have an impact on uh, the next generation of peregrine falcons. All right, so one of the top animals that peregrine falcons eat, especially those that are traditional or tend to stay around 10 or less miles from a water source, is that those peregrine falcons will eat the eared grebs. Um, and these are the single largest contributors of mercury contamination with peregrine falcons. Um, now peregrine falcons will eat these birds and be exposed to mercury, even though it is not in Lake Mead and some of the other Southern lakes and water systems, they will eat this animal and be exposed and absorb this mercury. Now this is because the eared grebs, they tend to migrate to the greater, um, greater Salt Lake area, and then they will eat eat organisms there, and those organisms have a higher concentration of mercury. And this is because of mining and many other, other things. However, because of the mining and it flowing through the water systems and eventually landing in Salt Lake area, um, the, the um, eared grebs are exposed to this mercury for about two months while they're staying in this area. And then they will migrate back to Nevada, especially the Southern region. And then they will expose those organisms to that mercury contamination. Um, so they are the single largest contributor of mercury uh, contamination with the peregrine falcons. And about 15% of peregrine's diet consists of these birds. So it really has a dramatic impact on this. And they are Scientists and wildlife biologists are able to see this by studying the feathers of peregrine falcons. This is a non-invasive way of seeing what they are eating and what they are being exposed to. So this is something that they have been doing many studies on over the years and kind of seeing the toxicity levels of that. All right, so conservation and management has been very important, making sure and monitoring the peregrine falcon population and making sure that it does not decline again. So from 1988 to 1993, the Nevada Department of Wildlife reintroduced 48 peregrines into the wild um, to try and increase the population. And during the summer of 2003, a nesting pair was found in the White Pine Range. And this was the northernmost uh, nesting pair in over 30 years. So this was a very important find. And since then we've been seeing more nesting pairs, and, but we are still making sure and keeping track of any new nesting pairs. So one of the ways that we are doing this is through banding. Now the Southern region has been doing a lot of work making sure that individuals are banded and have their own individual marks. And this is a great, great way of keeping track and seeing where these individuals end up. Now there are two types of bands. There is an aluminum one, as you can see in the picture, and this has a number along it, and this comes from Fish and Wildlife. Now this is a good one. However, it is hard to see those numbers. So if you do find one of these bands, it's very important to call in and kind of like give people an update on where these bands ended up and whether this was on a dead peregrine falcon or maybe fell off. Now there is another band. It is a black and white band and it has larger numbers. It's much easier to see. It's much more legible. Um, so you can even see these through scopes and digital cameras. If you are able to take a picture of a peregrine falcon with these bands, it would be great to see um, or great to send these in to the Nevada Department of Wildlife or Fish and Wildlife. So that way we can kind of see how these peregrine falcons are doing. So many peregrine falcons uh, can be identified by these bands. Uh, over two or over 100 nestlings have been banded and this is a continuing effort and more are being banded. All right, now transmitters. Transmitters are another great way of keeping track of these birds. You can see in the picture, this is not a peregrine falcon. However, there are plans to add transmitters onto peregrine falcons 
to provide more data and see kind of where they are traveling to, maybe their migratory routes or how they're moving through the state of Nevada, where they are nesting and where they are habitating. So this, these transmitters are much harder to put on the individuals because they need to be specifically fitted to the body. They can't be bigger than 3% of the peregrine falcon's body weight. Um, so they need to be individually placed on the bird. Um, you can see it kind of looks like a backpack, but they are individually fitted to each of the birds and they only last about three to five years before falling off. So they don't last the entire lifetime. It's just long enough. So that way we can collect data and see where these birds are moving to. All right, so here are three maps. Uh, these were also provided by Joe Barnes. These are very helpful in kind of seeing how the population has changed throughout Nevada. You can see in the 1950s, there were not many nesting pairs, not many populations of peregrine falcons. Um, however, in 2008, you can see more of them, mostly in the southern region. And then in 2019, you can see that the population has dramatically, in dramatically increased. Uh, mostly in the southern region, but also in the central region as well. All right, so I hope that answered a lot of everyone's questions about peregrine falcons, but I'm going to leave it open now to more questions. So if you do have questions, put those in the Q&A box and I can answer them. Great, thanks so much. Um, I definitely learned a lot from you tonight. Um, so I have a question while people are kind of gathering their thoughts, thinking of more for you. What is your favorite fact about peregrine falcons? Um, I think my favorite fact is just that they're such good parents. I looked at a lot of videos while I was doing this of peregrine falcons, and you can kind of see that they just take turns and they really, they're, they do everything for those nests. Like I even saw one video of peregrine falcon fighting a uh, um, pelican that was getting too close to the nest. So they are very territorial, um, but they're incredible predators and they're just incredible parents as well. Awesome. That's a good fact. I like it. Um, so one of the questions is where do the eared grebes get mer mercury and how does it affect them? So the ear grebes, um, they, it does affect them. We're not seeing it affecting them quite as much as the peregrine falcons, just because uh, the peregrine falcons are, are absorbing um, a lot more of the toxins um, by eating more of the ear grebes. But the ear grebes, they get the mercury uh, toxins from eating other aquatic animals that have been exposed to that mercury for longer periods of time. So the mercury does come a lot from the mining. Um, it travels downstream and then once it reaches the Salt Lake area, it kind of accumulates, especially on the upper layer of the water. And because waterfowl tend to stay at that upper layer, they absorb a lot more of the mercury than some of the other aquatic animals. But because they're just there for a long period of time and they're eating other animals that have been exposed to it for a long period of time, um, they're able to, to get a lot of that mercury toxin those mercury toxins enough so that way it impacts the populations of peregrine falcons that are not used to that. Perfect, thank you. Um, what make of transmitters are they looking to use for the falcons and will this be a real-time GPS tracking type of tracking or a once daily blip to a satellite? Um, so I am not exactly sure the name of this transmitter. Um, but this would be about every three years. It would give a satellite a location um, for those birds. And because they're moving around, it would kind of be a good indicator of their habitat. Perfect. But yeah, this is something that they're still planning and working on, um, but hopefully it will be in the near future just so that we have more data and can learn more about peregrine falcons. Awesome, thank you. Um, is there a way to encourage them to start nesting in an area? I could not find um, sources or any details about that. Um, they do tend to be picky. Oh, I forgot to mention this actually. They do tend to be very picky about the nesting sites they choose. Uh, whenever the males are courting the females, 
uh, they will actually find many nesting locations and show the females. And then the, the female will eventually choose one. Um, so we're not exactly sure what specifically they are looking for, but typically they are just looking for those areas that are high elevation, but that would be very hard for people to go in and kind of show the peregrine falcons um, the best nesting sites because they have all those different factors that they are looking at. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then we have a question, how fast do they fly? Um, they, would this be horizontally or vertically? Um, okay, well, the, the fastest one um, that was diving, she was around 240 miles per hour horizontally. I'm not quite sure, but it is not very fast in comparison. But typically they will tend to stay around 200, maybe a little bit less whenever they are diving. Awesome, thank you. Um, and we have uh, a young person here who asked if they can have one as a pet for falconry. Um, so becoming a falc or um, a falcon falconer, I believe that's how you say it. Um, that takes about two years of training. You have to apprentice under another falconer. So it's very difficult to get that certification. Um, but we are not, or people are not allowed to have these birds as pets because they are protected and because they are a bird of prey. Um, but you do, do need that certification if you do want to eventually own one. Um, but you, I believe you have to have a reason for it. I think you have to apply for it as well. Yeah, there's a whole permitting process and you have to be trained by a falconer and um, there's lots you have to do because we want to make sure that the birds are well taken care of. Right, right. Um, do you know how much the transmitters cost and how many do you estimate are currently being used? I am not exactly sure how much they cost. Currently there are none being used by um, for peregrine falcons, um, but they are being used for golden eagles in Nevada and some other birds of prey. Perfect. Um, so uh, we have a question, what does mercury do to the birds? Um, I believe, I'll go back to that slide. They believe it, did I go past it? They believe it might, yeah, I went past it. Um, they do believe that it might cause infertility, um, they're still researching it and kind of studying the biological effects of it, um, but it can have damage to the nervous system, the circulatory system, and the endocrine system, which, which would cause um, or could cause infertility. So it's not sure if it would cause the same effects as DDT with the thinning of the shells or the lessening of clutches of eggs, um, but it does cause effects and it could potentially kill peregrine falcons because of all the medical issues they would have. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one that says, I know that San, San Jose City Hall building had a webcam at a nest. Do you know of any other nest webcams while you were doing your research? I believe there are more. I do not have the exact names, um, but there might even be some internationally because um, I know they've been doing a lot of research um, around the world on peregrine falcons. They've actually studied the, going back to the mercury, they've actually studied um, the feathers of peregrine falcons in Greenland. And they actually found that this was, they had mercury in their system. So mercury is something that's affecting populations all over the world, um, very similarly. Thank you. Um, has Nevada had many issues with poisonings or nest descriptions? destruction from human activity or has it mainly been positive? I'm not sure about Nevada specifically, but I have seen that, especially in farming areas where they might leave out poison for pests. Sometimes peregrine falcons will, will eat those pests, especially mice and smaller birds, um, and then they will themselves be poisoned. So that has been an issue um, in trying to reduce the amount of poisonings. Um, Yes, I believe that answered the question. Yeah, totally. Um, thank you. Um, how likely are they attack? They likely to attack free roaming chickens. Ooh, 
Chickens? I'm not sure about chickens. Probably not quite as often. Typically they um, go after birds. Um, so if they're not looking for chickens, I wouldn't imagine that they would specifically target the chickens. Yeah, with any kind of free roaming animal, um, you kind of have to expect a loss because there are other hawks that will certainly go after them or owls. Um, so it's always important to kind of try and protect them and keep them in confined areas that have roofs. Um, and that's the best kind of way to protect your chickens. Um, do you know which one determines the return to the same nest site, the male or the female or the new individuals? Um, from what I saw, the females are typically in charge of where the nesting site is. Uh, they're not exactly sure, or at least Joe Barnes, who I spoke to in the southern region, he wasn't exactly sure about what caused um, what caused a pair of peregrine falcons to change nesting sites. Um, but I would imagine that it is, it is the female. He did notice one, um, one pair. They actually moved seven miles away from their original nesting site and wasn't exactly sure. But there was a new pair that moved into their old one. So maybe it was just that that new pair had moved in before they did, um, but he wasn't entirely sure. Could be lots of things, right? <laughs> right? Right, there's so many different factors that go into all this. And because peregrine falcons are very mysterious and it's hard to track them, there's a lot of questions that we have. Absolutely. Um, one question that we have is how can you tell how old they are after their fourth year when they get their adult plumage? Question. Um, after they get their adult plumage, I'm not entirely sure. How, how you would you would find that information out. Um, I think a lot of the wildlife biologists have been doing it by monitoring them and kind of seeing how long they've been nesting, but I'm not sure just by looking at them how you would do that. Yeah, a lot of the time we get um, data about uh, aging from birds that we have tracked and trans um, put trackers on or bird bands on. Um, and then when someone reports those bands then we know, oh, this bird was banded in their nest in 2010. So we know it's 10 years old now or whatever the case may be. So that's how we get a lot of those estimates. Um, are there any conflicts around urban populations? Uh, might urban populations ever be, ever need to be relocated? From what I saw, um, urban populations, they tend to stay in areas where there aren't as many people unless they are hunting, um, but they tend to stay away from people. So I don't believe there have been many issues um, other than them getting um, killed by running into power lines just because they don't know to look out for that. Um, so sometimes they will fl fly into those power lines and need to be rehabilitated, but then I believe they typically move them to a new location. So I think that's the only reason why they would choose to move a peregrine falcon um, from those urban areas. Yeah, typically we don't um, move birds because they, they fly away pretty quick from us. <laughs> um, how are they trapped to, for putting on transmitters? Um, so what they will, they tend to do is they will, they will get a dove or a pigeon or some smaller bird um, and they will tie, they will tie them onto their hand or the wildlife biologist will tie the bird onto their hand and they will kind of hold them out and capture them that way. Um, and then from there, usually they don't end up losing the smaller birds. Sometimes they will, but often I know they what they used one bird about six times before or without having anything happen to it, um, but that's typically how they do it. They bait the bird, the peregrine falcon, and then they capture them that way and hold on to their talons and then place them into a container. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, though, Jess. Yeah, I haven't been on a peregrine falcon um, catch yet, but sounds. Sounds about right to me. Carefully, I think, is the, the biggest answer for it. <laughs> very carefully and with very thick gloves. <laughs> you do not want those talents accidentally impaling you while you're doing that. Yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, how are the feathers tested for toxins? 
Um, so they, I believe they break the feathers down with chemicals. I am not entirely sure about the specifics of that, um, but I know some of the other researchers, they would, they would capture the, the peregrine falcon, um, take a couple of feathers from it, band it, and then, um, and then use those feathers to kind of see how much mercury was in, in the buildup of the feather. Perfect, thank you. We've got time for a few more if you're up for it. Perfect. Um, do the males ever fight and do they fight to the death? Um, I do not believe that the males fight very much unless it's over a territory. Um, may, they might fight to the death if it was for that, but typically they don't tend to fight unless they have, they are trying to steal food or they are in another peregrine falcon's territory. Perfect, thank you. Um, how far north do the Nevada Falcons make it? Do any get as far as Canada, for instance? Uh, yes, peregrine falcons, definitely they get into Canada area. Oh, I'll go back to the map that I had. Um, but yes, they travel into parts of Canada. There it is. Yes, so they do often migrate to Canada, um, not as much the American falcons, um, but the American falcons, they don't tend to migrate quite as much as I believe the Arctic subspecies family or Arctic subspecies of peregrines. Um, but yes, they will migrate into parts of Canada. Thank you. Um, do you have any like favorite stories about falcons? Um, well, I, I guess there, I've seen a peregrine falcon once in my life and it was definitely very memorable. I was in the North Cascades and um, we were in the middle of the mountains um, on Devil's Dome. I'm not sure if anybody knows where that is, but it's very high up and we didn't think we would see much wildlife, but then we happened to see this peregrine falcon and we recognized it because of the dive that it made. It started flying overhead and we weren't sure exactly what it was. Uh, my professor at the time, he thought it might've been a golden eagle. Uh, it was very small for a golden eagle, but that's what he thought. And then we saw it all of a sudden dive straight down and capture some sort of rodent, um, but it did this. But yeah, if you can see these in the wild, I definitely recommend it uh, because it's, it's amazing seeing them do, doing those incredible um, aerial dives. For sure, they're super impressive. Um, okay, we'll do two more. So the first one is, do you know any fiction or nonfiction books uh, to learn more about peregrines? I do not. Um, unfortunately, I do not. I know National Geographic has done a lot of research and has covered um, the peregrine falcons. Um, so if you were to look into those resources, sometimes they make it They'll um, put games together or they'll have videos, but I'm not exactly sure about the books. There is one um, that was published in 20, uh, 2004 and it's called The Peregrine and I'll put a link in the um, answer for you there, but that's um, a pretty good one. It has some good ratings. I haven't read it yet though. Um, okay, and the last one is we usually see peregrine falcons on telephone slash communication towers. Is there any study on how radiation from these antennas affect the health, health of adults or chicks? I'm sorry, you broke up in the middle of that. Could you say that again? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, okay, we usually see peregrine falcons on telephone slash communication towers. Is there any study on how radiation from these antennas affect health of adults? or chicks? Not that I've seen. I would imagine that would be very hard to study, but maybe one day they will. Uh, but I didn't, I haven't seen any research on that. Okay, sorry. This time I promise last one. Um, no problem. <laughs> I have seen other countries allow people to have falcons. Do you know how this affects numbers? Um, often those falcons are bred 
So I'm not sure exactly how it would impact the wild populations, um, but I haven't seen um, any statistics on how that might impact them. Yeah, and a lot of uh, some falconers, what they do is they'll get like native birds um, when they're really young and then they'll kind of try and teach them to hunt. And then after a while, they will release them into the wild because they do have such a uh, poor um, survival uh, statistic. I think um, Ava said 60% for, for that first year. So that is another way that they kind of try and help um, keep those populations up because they love the birds too. Awesome. Well, I think we've got um, to almost everything. I'll type out a few more answers, um, but thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. Uh, at the end of this, there will be a survey. So if you could tell us how we are doing, that would be awesome. Um, Ava, thank you so much. I know I learned a ton from you um, and I'm sure everyone else did as well. Great. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining in. I hope you learned a lot about Peregrine Falcons um, and I hope you guys have a great weekend too. All right, do you want me to end it, Jess? Yep, you can end or, it. Okay, all right, thanks. Thanks everyone.